looking into the president's finances, or if he has already looked into the president's finances, does the president, does this White House believe that is a red line, and if so, why? Oh. Look, I think it's important to note, um, and hopefully you guys have seen this statement, that uh, Jay Sekulow, a member of the president's legal team, has put out within the last hour that they confirmed that the news reports that the special counsel had subpoenaed financial records relating to the president are completely false. No subpoena has been issued or received. We've confirmed this with the bank and other sources. I think that this is another example of the media going too far too fast, uh, and we don't see it going in that direction. Former Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski, the author, co-author of a new book on the Trump campaign, Let Trump Be Trump, on sale right now. He has a copy right here, but look, we already have uh, a graphic for everybody to see of it. Uh, Corey, thank you for being here. My pleasure. So, you know, as we learn more about the situation with the people on Robert Mueller's team, this person who came up, and now we know it's been revealed, was sending out text messages, anti-Trump text messages. I want to first get your reaction on what that means overall as we look at the investigation. What this tells me is that this is part of what we like to call the deep state, career bureaucrats or government officials who are now in positions of power that are using their power pejoratively against American citizens. And it's amazing to me that this one individual, not only was he sending text messages that were anti-Donald Trump, he's the same individual who changed the wording for the Hillary Clinton final disposition. He's the same individual who uh, interviewed Huma Abedin, not under oath, the same individual who was so involved. I don't understand how one individual in the federal government could have so much authority over an investigation which is supposed to be nonpartisan, done by the very best our government has to offer. It's very troubling. You know, as I hear you talking about this, I also know that this comes kind of in the same realm, if you will, with the idea that not only was the wording changed for Hillary Clinton, but it was on the heels of, of her being exonerated, if you will, in writing by the FBI, the former uh, director of, of the FBI, James Comey. And then comes this whole question about whether or not uh, there were people around the president that may have compromised that situation. Well, it does. But look, Jim Comey, what we have found out about Jim Comey, Director Comey, through his public statements, mm -hmm. is that he leaked information to uh, former college professors, law professors, that he was comfortable with to make sure that that made it into the public realm. That's a problem. See, that's a, that in, in, in and of itself is a problem because when you sign the FBI manual, it says you will not leak any information that you've obtained as an employee of the FBI, of which he did. He's publicly said in his congressional testimony he's given that information away. How many times has Jim Comey leaked information to the detriment of private U.S. citizens or potential targets of an investigation? I'm very concerned about this. So then you fast forward, the president fires Jim Comey, and then you've got the questions now, and the Senate Intel Chair, uh, Richard Burr, and also Representative Trey Gowdy are saying that they don't agree with the president's attorneys who say that he didn't obstruct justice, potentially, when he fire James Comey. Now, you've just enumerated some reasons of why the president may have done that, even outside of the ones that we would know. Look, I think it is the president's prerogative uh, as the chief executive officer of our country to go and fire individuals who, who he does not believe are performing in accordance with what their responsibilities are. And we have seen this president act in that. And what we have seen is Jim Comey very likely could be uh, brought up on perjury charges before Congress. He's had to change his testimony on multiple occasions, saying he forgot he wasn't completely truthful on a number of occasions. That alone, to me, is enough concern. And then to rebrand the FBI with Director Ray, who's rebuilding the morale within there, is very, very important. Just sent out uh, an email to his staff today that we were reading about trying to lift that morale. There are great people, men and women, who serve every day as FBI uh, officials, agents, etc. It's so important. But when you have a leader that isn't following the rules, that permeates all the way down, and that becomes a problem within the organization. All right. So you were there. You were with the campaign as the president was heading into November, and then furthering that into the transition point. But more importantly, and specifically to someone who we know is part of the investigation, Paul Manafort, you worked with Paul Manafort? Yeah, I on did. The campaign? I did. All right. So there is a push now. Mueller's team is urging a federal judge to deny Paul Manafort's request to shake his house arrest. And then we learn that he wrote an op-ed with someone now, uh, an editorial with a person who reportedly has ties to Russian intelligence. What are your first thoughts on that? 
Look, my first thoughts are very clear. Number one, anything that Paul Manafort and his colleague Rick Gates has been accused of and indicted for took place some 10 years ago. It looks like they didn't pay taxes. They had wire fraud. They had a whole series of problems that they brought on onto themselves, which had nothing to do with Donald Trump. But here's where we are today. Paul Manafort has been put a gag order on by a judge not to talk about the Mueller investigation in the case. And if what is being reported is true, mm -hmm. which means he tried to partner to get an op-ed done to make himself look better with some type of Russian agent, and that is a, a problem with the gag order, then the judge is going to rule on that. And if that means he has to forfeit the surety bond that he's put forth, that's a decision a judge is going to make. Wow. You know, Corey, I, I've had people ask me, and now I'm going to put it to you because I have someone who actually knew Paul Manafort. Do you think that the campaign vetted him enough? Did you have enough to work with at that point? Look, the answer is no, and I'll tell you why. You know, Harris, when, we, when he came to the campaign, he was brought in to be the delegate hunter, to help us make right. sure that we had 1,237. He was good at that, Well, look, he was the last guy alive from 1976 who had ever done this job, right? Oh, my goodness. And so that was the last time there was a Republican contested convention. So his job was to go and make sure that Donald Trump secured 1,237 delegates and became the Republican nominee for President of the United States. That job morphed into him becoming the campaign chairman. Once that had occurred, he had no core competency to run the campaign. And what we saw was from my tenure of leaving the campaign to Kellyanne Conway and Steve Bannon and Dave Bossie coming in, it was about an eight week window, and that's all Paul stayed for. Do you, and I understand about the, the delegate count and all that, but considering what it looks like Bob Mueller is doing now, and, and I don't think he would deny this because this is what you do you do a no knock raid. On Paul Manafort's home, you put pressure on the people who were close to the president. Any regrets having aligned Paul Manafort with the campaign? Oh, sure. Look, I think if you were to go back and, and review this, knowing what we know about Paul Manafort, the public reports say that he was under a FISA warrant prior to coming to the mm -hmm. campaign. He was under a FISA warrant after he left the campaign. Look, I think there's probably some liability there that no one from the government ever informed the leading presidential candidate that you've got a potential crook or at least someone who's under investigation. Wow. Look, I think that's a real concern. If there's all this talk about collusion and cooperation and coordination with Russia, of which we had none of and the president had none of. And there's if, not been found any of it. But if that. Paul Manafort was doing something illegal, maybe somebody should have alerted us to it and said, hey, this is a potential concern moving forward. You mean in a, in a more timely fashion than potentially you found out? Well, look, we found out after public reports, basically. Look, the media is how we found out. Can I talk to you about the money? Sure. So it came to us just a little while ago here at Fox News that special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation has spent n nearly $7 million in the first four and a half months of existence. What are your thoughts on that? Look, I think it's a lot of money. And what we've seen is uh, Mr. Mueller and his team have brought uh, indictments down on two individuals from things they did 10 years ago has no relation to the campaign. The two other people who have pled guilty to felonies have no relation to the president whatsoever. And what they've been found guilty of is lying to the FBI, which is a crime. And so, look, it seems like a lot of money right now for what has amounted to be not a lot of evidence of anything that relates to the campaign, collusion. There is no collusion. There is no cooperation. This has nothing to do with the president. So look, let's do this. Let's bring the investigation to a close in a timely manner. Let's make sure that all ex everything has been exhausted and that we've finalized. So you have the patience for Mueller to finish his job. Look, I mean, I, you're, I, you're not in the camp where do you remove Mueller? You're not no, in that camp. Look, I think you have to have them. You have to have him finish his job. But I think there has to be a time frame because what happens historically is these independent investigations will go from 18 to 24 months and they'll start in one place and end in a different place. I think like every other agency within the government, there has to be accountability. You don't just get a blank check to stay and run it as long as you want to. All right, last, last point. The Department of Justice actually just released those numbers. That's how we come by them. They look uh, at May 17th through September 30th, 2017, uh, $7 million nearly in four and a half months. Uh, before we let you go, I, I want to talk with you just, just a second about what the title means, Let Trump Be Trump. Who's Trump? Let's flash the book up. What does that mean? It's very simple. You know, I came to a campaign and had the privilege of working next to a man who'd been successful in real estate, in being an author, a, a television personality, and now in politics. And what that means is I don't want to change him. Nobody should Do try and change him. Do you wish he'd tweet less? I don't. You know why? I love the <laughs> You're fact... You're the only one who's no, answered yeah, that question that way, Corey. I, on, Everybody else no, tells me true. yes. You know why? Because I love when he's genuine and authentic and directly to the American people and his 45 million Twitter followers love listening to him. So real quickly, there was a mistake, though, recently with his attorney tweeting on, or at least writing a tweet on his behalf with regard to firing James Comey. Your quick thought exiting on that. Look, very importantly, there is a process and a procedure 
procedure before all Twitter uh, information gets distributed on the president's account. Let's make sure those protocols are in place. And if his attorney did something he shouldn't have, let's tighten those protocols a little bit. Corey Lewandowski. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Read Trump. Let Trump be Trump. All right. And we'll let Corey be Corey. Thanks thank for coming you. in.